Getting our friends together isn't as easy as it used to be. We get it. Life comes at you fast. But trust us, your pals are desperate for a good hang. And when they hear you stock the party with drinks from Drizzly, they'll be banging down your door. Let Drizzly, the go-to app for drink delivery, take care of the supplies. All you need is an excuse. It doesn't even have to be a good one. It's your dog's birthday. The loquats are finally ripe. Whatever. With Drizzly, you can compare prices on a massive selection of beer, wine, and spirits and get them delivered straight to your door, which means you can entice the crew to leave their houses without ever leaving yours. Whatever the occasion, download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com. Today. Must be 21 plus. Not available in all locations. Man, I wish they had Drizzly when I used to play D&D and riffs. Maybe it's time for me to start again. Thanks, Drizzly. Do you ever feel like life is a never-ending series of lessons while you try to find purpose, meaning, and answers? I am Vanessa Fontana, the host of Figuring Shit Out, a podcast where we undertake self-help, coming of age, and healing. As I live my 20s in New York City, figuring shit out myself, I've realized that if you spend your whole life trying to get your act together, you don't have a life. You have an act. On Figuring Shit Out, every Sunday, you get to normalize the journey of not knowing and be guided into living your life with more intention and ease. Hey! It's my song! Let's sing it! It's gonna be freaking awesome! Come on! It's gonna be freaking awesome! You know the words! It's gonna be freaking awesome! Yo, everybody! It's Wednesday. It's Jesse Blaze Snyder. It's the coolest geek alive. That's me. I'm coming at you with some awesome geek conversation pertaining to Spider Man Into the Spider Verse 2, the sequel to the Spider Verse franchise, which I don't know about you, but I happen to think that the first Spider Verse movie is one of the greatest, if not the single greatest animated films I've ever seen. It is the most beautiful animated film. It brings to life comic books in a way that I've never seen them brought to life before. And I will say, um, because I'm not going to review the movie until sort of the end of this thing, but I will say it lives up to the visual aspect of the first one. This movie is just as beautiful as the other one. And, you know, I want to talk about this movie. I have a lot of similar feelings that I have to Super Mario Brothers, the movie, which I think is a little weak, but I think it did a lot of things correctly that encouraged the audience to come see it because they could they could tell that Illumination was lovingly recreating the Super Mario world and that the movie would be reflective of the fandom that they're a part of. Similarly, Into the Spider-Verse is doing this in a very big way. Into the Spider-Verse is showing an authentic comic book world that Miles Morales and Gwen Stacy are coming from. And it makes us as an audience want to go there. You know, we see this, we recognize this. This looks just like the thing that we love. Let's go check it out. And uh, in the case of a sequel like this, it looks, uh, at least spiritually, like a really solid follow-up to the thing that we've already decided universally, us as fans, we love. We love Into the Spider-Verse. We'd like some more. So I'm going to get to my review in a second, but I want to talk about some things that happened uh, leading up to the release of Into the Spider-Verse. Now, this isn't actually related to Spider-Verse itself. It's all about The Little Mermaid. Leading up to the release of The Little Mermaid and the actual release of The Little Mermaid, you were finding articles online about racist backlash from the fandom. In the lead up, they were talking about American fans basically being upset. It would always be boiled down to a racist backlash over Hailey Bailey being black. And it's very much focused. Racism is words used and people are upset because she's black. This isn't right. We're not upset because she's black. We're upset because Ariel isn't. Ariel isn't. Ariel is not black. So we're not upset that, oh, Haley Bailey's, Bailey's black. It's that you're making a Little Mermaid movie starring Ariel, a character that we know and love, and we know what she looks like. So your audience that you're trying to sell a remake of a classic film to, 
you're like, hey, here she is. There's Ariel. And the audience looked and we went, that's not Ariel. Now, it's so funny because they have a, a little viral video that's going around of like two little girls kind of barely reacting to the fact that the Little Mermaid is black now. And basically it's a little girl. One of the little girls goes, that is Ariel. And the other girl goes, she's brown. And it's very cute. But honestly, I have two little girls. And these little girls in the video, they're reacting to a beautiful girl on screen who looks like them. And and their reaction is, is a perfectly sweet reaction. It's not an intelligent reaction. And I don't mean that to say that these little girls aren't intelligent. Of course, they're going to grow up to be very intelligent. But their perspectives are relatively small in terms of what they're seeing. They're being presented with a beautiful mermaid who looks like them. Yeah, that's really appealing. But there's another video that you can find of just slightly older, I think maybe like a half a year to a year, maybe two years at the most older, older than these little girls who are just kind of like, oh, is another little girl who goes, that's not Ariel. She Ariel's white. And, and Ariel doesn't have any braids. This girl has braids. Ariel doesn't have braids. And that is what we're talking about here. It's not about racism. It's about the braids. It's about the change. Um, there's a guy on YouTube who I like to listen to sometimes who gives really accurate information and as far as box office representation for all these films, Valiant Renegade. Valiant Renegade said something in passing that I thought was on the money exactly the right answer. He said, I think that that Little Mermaid could have made an extra $100 million in like its opening weekend if... The lady, Halle Bailey, playing Ariel actually just had normal red hair that looked similar to the Little Mermaid's red hair. Isn't that funny, right? This is a financial analyst for film saying all they needed to do was make her hair look more like the hair of the character that we know. And then people would recognize it and go, ooh, it's the thing I like. And they'd be excited to show up to the film. So, you know, he's 100% correct. It, it's just, it's the truth. For me, this, hey, everybody's reacting because they're racist. Okay, that's not true. And the proof is a week after The Little Mermaid comes out. And, and granted, they stopped calling the fans in America racist the first week of The Little Mermaid because The Little Mermaid did rather well in America. It didn't do great, but it did okay. It made about $95 million um, in America stateside. And then worldwide, though, it did really not so great, and they started calling all of the international audiences racists. This past weekend, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse 2 came out, and... Did the racist fans stay home? Did these sexist fans stay home? I mean, this movie is starring Miles Morales. He's half black, half Hispanic. It's also kind of starring Gwen Stacy, who is an activist depicted in the film, and she's a female. And oh my God, what's going to happen? Oh my, it's $120 million. That's what's going to happen because nothing has been changed because Miles Morales is being honored. Miles Morales was introduced as a new character who was half black and half Hispanic, and we embraced him as an audience. I am one of those people who was reading Ultimate uh, Ultimate Spider-Man when it was coming out and Peter Parker's character died in that book and Miles Morales was introduced by Brian Michael Bendis and it was great. I love the book. I love the character. Really enjoyed it. So when Spider-Verse was promoted in the first place, I was like, oh great, he's a great character. I can't wait to see that. I hope they do a good job with Gwen Stacy too. These characters had great visuals. In the case of Miles Morales, they really had done a, a wonderful foundation for his family and his supporting characters and who he was as a character. And the audience was waiting and we ate it up. What do I say? Don't change the characters that exist. Make new ones. We love new characters when they're handled right. You know, a great example of this is the character of Spike in X-Men Evolution. In a lot of animated series in particular, you'll see sort of like corporate choices that get made. In the case of Muppet Babies, they wanted more girls in the Muppet Babies playroom. Um, so they, they added Scooter uh, to, uh, I mean, sorry, Skeeter to be a sister to Scooter. Skeeter's a great character. She's a tomboy, uh, and she was a great bit of representation, really a great counter to Miss Piggy. And she was invented out of thin air, but she was perfect. She was exactly the type of female character that they needed. She was new. There's no reason for us to reject her as an 
audience. And in fact, the audience went, oh, this is great. We'd love to see her uh, again in the future. And uh, me and my friends, when we were adapting uh, Muppet comic books for Boom Studios many years ago, I remember Aaron uh, and the people who he was working on one of the comic books with, they brought Skeeter into the comic book as an adult, and fans were so excited to see her. We're excited to see her because it's not just some character that existed and we loved and you changed it. And now it's not exactly the character that we loved. It's a new character that we have the opportunity to love anew. And if they fit within the context of the world that we're looking to see, we're going to fall in love with them. And Spike's another one. Spike was an X-Men mutant character on X-Men Evolution. And honestly... Spike just seems so boring because there was a character in the comics called Marrow who would grow these bone protrusions out of her body and she was, I think she's just very kind of creepy and scary and she would like freak out and she wasn't exactly the most settling of characters. When she was around, you always kind of felt a little uncomfortable. And Spike had similar kind of powers to her, which weren't super exciting. You'd be pulling out Spikes. And then he was also like a skateboarder, which was kind of a trope and a trend at that time. So I didn't think I was going to like this. Here, they're shoehorning in an additional a black character, a Hispanic character, whatever it is, when there's tons of diverse characters in the X-Men universe who I would love to see brought to life, like Bishop or anybody else. And um, and I was like, ah, I don't know, probably not going to like this guy. Well, a season into X-Men Evolution and I would have told you Spike was probably one of my favorite characters. He was done really well because he didn't have a lot of baggage from the comics. They could kind of do anything they wanted with him. They didn't need to like know what they had to do and he could fit within the holes uh, within the stories that they were telling and he, he could fill in the blanks and he was great. You like this character. So this is creating new characters for an existing fandom and the fandom didn't reject the character. The fandom went, oh wow that's, that's awesome. We like that. I swear, comic book fans fans. We love diversity. The biggest popular comic book for years has been the X-Men. And the main reason is because X-Men is your one-stop shop for diversity. And honestly, I hate that word diversity because it makes it sound so racist to me. You know, it's like we're not supposed to notice. We're not supposed to notice all this. We should just be naturalistically reaching for this different thing to contrast, that different thing to contrast, that different thing to contrast, that different thing. They're different. Yeah, they're all different. We're all different. When we're watching science fiction movies and we go into a room filled with aliens that is not just they're not alien they're races they're different races the fantasy world of the lord of the rings the elves are a different race you don't need to make them black to make additional allegory to the fact that the elves are already a different race from the men who are a different race from the dwarves who are a different race from the orcs who are a different race from the balrogs these are all different races in middle earth Honestly, looking at these diverse races and seeing them as white demonstrates a bit of racism going on in the minds of the people who are seeing them that way. So so, so we're, we're really not thinking about these things so well because we have a very myopic idea about what race and representation really means. So getting back to this little girl who's like, hey, that's not Ariel. Ariel's white and she doesn't have braids. There's something that they are screwing up here that's very important, and it's visual recognition. Once we've imprinted on a character, changing them in any way is like taking one of our best friends, and I mean this, like one of our best friends, and replacing them with a different person. But you're telling us they're the same person? That's my best friend. They, they look different. This feels weird. And then as we're watching them, because they don't look like our best friend, they don't look like our favorite character anymore, we spend our whole time trying to figure out if the new person feels authentic to the person we knew. So that's Ariel, huh? Well, is she going to sing as good as Ariel? Is she going to charm me as good as Ariel? Is she going to be nice to her friends, Scuttle, Flounder? The way you know that that I enjoyed. Am I going to enjoy this character in all the same levels? We, we sort of have to wait to actually start enjoying the character on the same level. So we were already enjoying the character at this particular level. Now you've changed the visual. We go all the way back down to like a fresh perspective of: Is this the thing that we like? Will this continue to be the thing we like? So. Just right there, do you really want to take your audience from accepting that I like this thing and I'm here because I like this thing to, oh, well, I'm here because I like this thing, but it doesn't exactly look like the thing that I like. I hope it's going to be as good as the thing I like. Hmm. This is a place of judgment. We were completely open. We were open to see stories starring the person we like. Now we're like, oh, 
Well, is this even the thing we like? Is that even the person I like? Hmm, I'm not really familiar with this. We spend our time trying to figure out if the new person feels authentic to the person we knew, and this gives up the great blessings of a continuing story, which is familiarity. If we don't have familiarity with the characters, you wouldn't have bought the intellectual property in the first place. If you change them so that they get less well-defined by representing them in contrary ways, you begin to erode the associations connected to the character. And before you know it, the audience stops recognizing them for who they are supposed to be. The big reason this is stupid is because there's absolutely no need to do this. The audience will never be mad at you for recreating the characters that they already love with respect to the artists who designed them in the first place and with awareness of what the audience is looking for from them. Yeah. This whole situation when the, the fandom doesn't enjoy something, everything is boiled down to these crappy defining words, racism, sexism. Um, I don't know what ism they're using when they're trying to say that the comics community or the geek community is against LGBT plus issues. No, not at all. Nobody is coming from this place. We're coming from a place of we have something that we love and we'd love to see more of it. But people who love Superman and love Captain America and love Spider-Man, we are very liberal when it comes to wanting people to be able to live and let live and everybody to be able to pursue the happiness that they have in their hearts. That's what all of us want to see. So to turn around and call that audience a racist, a sexist, like, well, one, it's completely tone deaf, but worse than that, it is wrong and offensive. And I'm here to defend my fellow geeks. What the hell are you doing? Shut your mouths. We are historically more progressive than you have been. You've sucked the geek culture into the center of this political shitstorm, this completely partisan conversation that you guys want to have about Republicans and Democrats and half the country is racist and whatever, whatever you want to believe, that's not us. That's not the lovers of Superman and Spider-Man and Captain America. We're not racist. We're not sexists. You guys are using things that we love and you're trying to sell it to us. And we're telling you, hey, this doesn't exactly look like the thing that we love. We would like this to be more reflective of this thing that we've been supporting for all our lives, that I've been reading these comic books for years and years. I've been flashing my eyes on Superman. I want him on the big screen to look like how he looks on the small panel in my comic book. I don't want him to look like whatever the image of the day that you'd like to put on the screen is. I want the medium that I love to be respected. And this is what's happening when the fans are rejecting some of the things that you're putting out. It has nothing to do with sexism, racism. We wouldn't be lining up to see Miles Morales and Gwen Stacy in the Into the Spider-Verse franchise. But we are. Why? Because we don't care about any of that stuff. We really don't. We're, we're not sexist. We're not racist. We are the people who have championed Sigourney Weaver you know, as the lead Ripley in the Aliens franchise. We are the people who made Wesley Snipes' Blade a, a, a freaking sensation, okay? This racist fandom, Blade. You know, there, there are people like Avi Arad, or Avi Arad or whatever, who was like one of the head people at Marvel for a long time, who was stopping the release of something like a Black Panther or a Black Widow. Blade came out, what, 40 years ago now or something? I don't know, how. Like, like oh, I guess like 30 years ago. And the fans embraced it with open arms, enough for there to be a big sequel that was a success, enough for them to do a third one that was less of a success, but wasn't a, not a success because of fucking racism. Maybe it was. Maybe we were all racist against all these white guys that got added to the third movie all of a sudden. We were like, screw all these white people. But you'll never see a headline like that that says, oh, well, clearly Blade Trinity didn't work because the audience is racist against Ryan Reynolds and uh, Jennifer, um, what's her name? Uh, I forget the lady. She's so pretty. Um, the lady who was playing Whistler's daughter in the film. Um, we're not racist, clearly. So... Please, like for all of you guys out there, when you see these headlines, when you see these things said, just immediately go, ah, oh, what a hyperbolic world we live in. This is so silly. And, you know, don't play into it and don't 
get upset and don't try to defend yourselves and don't defend anybody else because this is a game of PR, okay? It's PR, and I, and I want to explain this to you guys at length. PR, of course, stands for public relations. Uh, my father is uh, one of our listeners on the show, one of the, the, the coolest geeks alive. Shout out to you, Dad. The other day he said to me something about the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. I was talking about the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. It's not making as much money as it should. It's actually, it has legs, and it is making, I think I had said I, I was probably going to end up around $700 million or $800 million. Uh, It's probably going to end up around uh, $800 and maybe $50 million, which is really good considering where it started but still those numbers aren't great those numbers are not great for what Disney should be making from these things and more so those numbers aren't great for what Disney is actually spending on the making of these movies and spending on the promotion of these movies and when you really start to look at those numbers you see that it is all an illusion so much of the success that Disney in various forms and Warner Brothers and all these companies are having and seem to be having. Right now, the writer strike is going on in Los Angeles, and I think these writers are in for a rude awakening because these companies have been producing so much content. It is insane. Most of the contents are what is called loss leaders. They are the material that are filling up your Netflix and your HBO and your Hulu and all these things, all these original shows that they're making. So they have exclusive content and these things are losing. They are not having the audience. They are not making the company's money. They are making money on a show like Stranger Things or Cobra Kai or whatever else, but those are the tiny fraction of the shows that they're making. They're making a tiny amount of shows that have huge audiences, and they're making a lot of shows that have no audience whatsoever. And now we have banks shutting down and a lot of weird financial stuff going on in Hollywood, and it seems like all of these streaming services, which have not been able to defeat one another in the streaming wars, and are now all just tapped out with no money, still approximately in the same place they were yesterday, losing subscribers, and they don't know what to do. They don't. They don't know what to do. They've been just throwing money at this situation. And that is not the way to win the streaming wars. So my father said, well, remember, Jess, perception is reality. And and there's truth to that, you know, if Disney's putting out the press release that says, oh, look what we did and spinning everything to constantly make themselves look good, even when they have a lot of egg on their face, shouldn't I just be preaching the narrative that everybody knows and understands? No, no, I shouldn't be because there's the perception of reality and then there's reality. And if you start to understand the way to properly perceive reality, well, then you can know what the actual reality is. And that's what we're trying to teach here on uh, Coolest Geek Alive. You know, I want you guys to have an idea of what the actual culture is out there, okay? The actual culture is that when a movie is poorly reviewed, they will uh, twist the story to say that the people who are saying bad things about the movie, they can't be trusted because they're racists and all of their critiques are coming from a racist place. This isn't true. But all you need is one person on Twitter making one seemingly racist comment and then you can say that. You can get away with saying that now. Oh, everybody who didn't like Star Wars, it's not because the, the, the trilogy wasn't planned out very good. It's not because it didn't take the story to new places. It's because the lead is a girl, and we don't like girls. Yeah, Star Wars doesn't like girls. We don't adore Princess Leia. We don't adore Asaka Tano. Of course we do. The Star Wars fandom is not a bunch of sexists. It, this is just in, insane things to say. So they are playing a PR game because basically they can never look bad. Big companies like Disney or Warner Brothers, they got to always be coming out the other side of these things smelling like roses. And there is a number of practices that have been going on for years and years now, which people should know about. Things like uh, Captain Marvel was accused, and there's some decent evidence of this. And, I, and honestly, I'm somebody who sees movies all the time, and I see this regularly. 
I will go onto my app. I will choose the ticket for me and my girlfriend. We go down to see the movie and the seats that on my app were claimed. These were bought seats. There's nobody there. There's nobody sitting in the theater. Well, that was happening a lot when Captain Marvel was out. Captain Marvel made a billion dollars, all these things. And I believe that some of Captain Marvel's box office is legit. But I do believe that they played a very interesting game, especially in the initial lead up to Captain Marvel's release, basically pretending that they had sold more tickets than they did to perpetuate a hype machine saying that, oh, it's the next big thing and go out and see it and go out and see it. When there's things like seats being bought in theaters to fill up the theater and tell us how successful she was. And meanwhile, real hardcore fans like me, we know about these things. We've seen pictures of those theaters. We've seen these things being talked about in more detailed ways that point out some of the weirdness with the promotion at the time and some of the weirdness of things that was going on theater at the time. And this is happening all the time for various movies when they feel like they need a little extra bump and they'll buy out a theater or whatever it might be. Money can solve all problems. And putting money and ad dollars into getting out the message that the only reason why people don't like The Little Mermaid is because they're racist. That's good. Because every normal person who just hears that in passing, they're like, oh, okay, so it's probably pretty good. It's just these people who are, who are being racist. No, it's not. The main bit of critique with The Little Mermaid was that she didn't look right. Down to a little black girl, wherever she was, who watched the thing and went, hey, that's not Ariel. Yeah, we know, sweetheart. That's what we said, too. And you know what? If you try to make it Ariel, well, now this shorthand of a mermaid with red hair and, and purple seashells on her chest, then all of a sudden we go look and we're like, Hey, there's a there's a girl and she's a mermaid and she's got purple seashell. That's Ariel. Oh no, wait a second. Hey, there's a girl and she's she's black and she's got dreadlocks and she's a mermaid. Wait, is, could that be that that might be Ariel? Okay, because Ariel's now been shown to have dreadlocks, to just have red hair, to be white, to be black. So now there's multiple options in which, if we see that in theory, our brains have been programmed to recognize it. You don't want to do this. You don't want to, to, you want to distill the image into something that is replicated over and over again instead of distorting it to have multiple versions of itself where it starts to lose its cohesion and what matters about it doesn't matter anymore. Case in point, in the Spider-Verse, all of these Spider-Men make Peter Parker less unique. It just does. The more variations of the same idea makes the original seem less important than it was before. You know, I'm looking here at a board of, um, of I have a poster on my wall right in front of me. It's Batman and it's Batman supporting characters. And everybody's got a different hair color. Everybody's got a different vibe. Their costumes, they're, everything's working off each other. Uh, Red Hood, you know, he's rocking red. Nightwing, he's rocking blue. Uh, Robin, uh, Tim Drake Robin, he's got this green and yellow combo. Everybody's got a different color combination. Batwoman, she's red and black. Spoiler, she's purple and black. Um, the, the new guy, The Signal, he's yellow and black. Everybody is filling space that isn't being filled. The moment you start changing one element of the visual representation of the thing, all the other visual elements have to change as well because we literally did all the color designing and color balancing off of Ariel and her red hair, pale skin, purple seashells, green tail. You know, here we go. This is the color balance and then everything else is going to complement and make her pop. So once you change that, all the art direction from the original film goes out the window because now we have to art direct based on this new character who is supposed to be kind of aerial and is kind of aerial in some ways, but it's changed in a few significant ways and we're going to have to adjust to support that. So you don't want to have to be perpetually adjusting and perpetually changing, especially not when the audience has already said, there, stop, we love it. When your audience says, there, stop, we love it. Fucking stop. <laughs> Seriously, just, just stop. The biggest thing about all of this is it's all fantasy and science fiction filled with characters who are clearly not even human beings, but treated with humanity. This is the exact opposite of racism. Star Wars is a colorblind galaxy for the most part. Everyone can look like anything and be accepted. The pettiness of the representation game really comes into play in the face of this because it shows that you aren't noticing the non-racist worlds that we already created and you're applying your victims of racism model willy-nilly onto franchises where those doors were always open and instead of being changed, simply needed to be added to. All you have to do to these worlds is add yourself to it. You see something that's not in the world that you'd like to be right, just add it. 
add it. Don't change it to fit the thing. You don't hammer the square shape into the circle. You, you got to shave off the edges of the square. Then it'll fit in the circle. Or you get yourself a circle to begin with to put it to the circle hole. You don't bring the square and force it in. And this is what's happening. There's just a lot of forcing going on. And I mean, it's so funny to me because the real racists are these companies. You know, Black Panther, another film, wholly embraced by the audience. Why wouldn't we? It's wonderful. Everybody would be just as upset if Black Panther was turned into some white king. Promise you. I promise you. We'd be like, who wants to see that? The same reason why we were mad about Ariel is the same reason why we'd be mad about the Black Panther. Why wouldn't we? Why should he be any different than we would like to see him? But Disney wants the Black Panther and they want the diversity and they want the inclusion but not if it's going to make the Chinese upset. So the poster for Black Panther in America is Chadwick Boseman's face. The poster in China, he's wearing his helmet. The poster for Star Wars The Force Awakens in the American version, Finn is in the forefront. Hey, Black Stormtrooper, sweet. Then the poster for China, Finn is hidden. He's been removed or shrank. I forget which one. I think, I think he was just taken off the poster for the Chinese release of the film. Oh, no black people in this movie. Now on the Little Mermaid poster. If you see the normal Little Mermaid poster that'll be at the movie theaters by your house, you can clearly see Halle Bailey in the middle of the poster. You can see her skin color. You can see that she's different than your usual Ariel. Well, in the Chinese poster, she's like swimming up through the middle. Everything is washed out so you can't see the color of her skin and you can't really tell what race she is. This is racism. <laughs> this is actual racism. <laughs> Not fans going, hey, this doesn't look like the thing I like. Oh, hey, this doesn't look like the thing I like is a reasonable critique. Hey, you're a racist is not a good reply to that critique. There are just so many ways to do this right. I spoke about Skeeter and Spike. You know, you add a new character. IDW recently did this with their Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles line that was very successful. They had introduced a new female turtle, uh, Jenica, I think her name is, or Janica. Fans loved that. Also, you could dig a little deeper into the lore. Uh, case in point, David Goyer pulled out uh, Lucius Fox, who is one of the main and awesome supporting characters from the Batman mythology, and he's black. David Goyer said, all right, we've seen a lot of Commissioner Gordon. We've seen a lot of time with, you know, Alfred, whatever. We, we need some color here. There's a great character from the comics that we can bring in. His name's Lucius Fox. And readers like me, we already knew Lucius. We loved Lucius. We were like, oh, this is great, Lucius Fox. And then we're turning to all of our friends after we're leaving the movies, and we're like, oh, man, really love that character by Morgan Freeman. And we're like, yeah, Lucius Fox, he's a great character in the comics, too. You know, it's not that it was Morgan Freeman and that it was David S. Goyer and Christopher Nolan. It's that they mined and adapted a great character from the mythology and brought him into it. And in the right ways, because he is a character who's watching Batman's back and has an idea about him. And he's essentially the legitimate face of the Bruce Wayne empire for Bruce. Very important part of his mythology handled really well there you go you got a character that had some diversity going on you brought somebody in who had not been seen before but had the, the was the right color was the right vibe that they were looking for at the moment also justice league and justice league unlimited they brought in john stewart because they wanted um uh, a, another race besides the white guys understood john stewart's a great character the black green lantern and they brought in hawk girl um uh, for for the justice league another female you know to to uh, give additional support to wonder woman who's female in the justice league um this was great this is what happens you you can dust off an old character that people don't know about who fits what you're looking for or you can invent a new character that fits what you're looking for and if you do a good job with them we will embrace them as we embrace spike we embrace skeeter we embrace jenica and other ones and sometimes all you have to do is beef up the part that a character is playing that was maybe a little bit lightly written before lord of the rings did this really well there's uh, arrowin and eowyn i think that's their names right it's arrowin and eowyn but both of those characters from the original novels their parts were smaller and they were beefed up uh significantly given an action scene or, or, or given a moment here or there to shine from some of the other characters to 
give them more agency and put them into the story in a better way. And this is okay. Nobody's sitting there going, oh, that's so rough. We were glad to have an extra moment with Erwin. Those things were great. Those characters were handled well and set up well. And when they had their moments to shine, the audience was on board. This isn't like, a, and then we added in this character. And we like, no, nothing's been added in. We, we've just been additive to someone who was already existence in this universe. And we were additive in a way that was in support of the narrative that was already there, the characters that were already established. The fans are on board. Thumbs up, we say. Um, you know, we want authenticity, the most authenticity that we can get. That's what we want. The funniest one that I have here is Bane from Batman and Robin because the audience hated this character because he was brain swapped. Literally, the only major change about him really, I mean, visually he's close enough, is they made him stupid. And in the comics, you see, we get a, a Bane that's a little bit closer to the Bane from the comics in The Dark Knight Rises from Tom Hardy's Bane. But the Bane in that Batman and Robin movie, he's just an idiot. He's a goon who's strong manning for Poison Ivy. The Bane of the comics is a master st strategician. He, he makes a plan to break Batman's mind and body, and then he shows up and physically breaks Batman's back. But first, he breaks Batman's mind. That's the character. And the audience went, Ugh, this stupid asshole, and you're calling him Bane? He wasn't race swapped. He wasn't gender swapped. Our reaction was exactly the same. What you're calling us racists and sexists for is the same reaction that we had to Bane being stupid. It's not about the specifics of the change you're making. It's that you're making a change at all and that you're not delivering the goods to us the way we ordered them. We ordered a smart Bane. And we did. We ordered this. We ordered this when we went and we bought all the trade paperbacks of Batman getting his back broken. When we financially supported all these choices that you made and turned it into a big hit, made that character a success so that you could have him appear on various animated shows and have him appear in the movie to begin with, it was all because there was heat on that character. Heat on that character the way he was depicted, not the way that you depicted him. And you guys, you ruined it. You, you fucked it all up. Now, I'm going to get into my review of Into the Spider-Verse 2, and that's going to be a no-spoiler review. I don't want to ruin anything for anybody. Really, actually, I want to review it because I want to warn everybody and set people up to enjoy it more, actually. But before I do that, I have another Dear Jesse letter, and I'm so excited to read it, and thank you guys again for writing. If you want to write me a letter, I am jesseblaze at jessesnyder.com. Feel free to correct me or give me an alternate opinion or take on something that you have. Wh whatever you got to say, write me a letter. I am all ears and really excited to hear what you guys think about some of the things that I have to say. And I really wanted to read this one. I chose this one because it fits with a lot of the conversation that I'm having right now. So this letter says, Jesse, just listen to your episode on the Marvel Cinematic Universe and must say your knowledge is refreshing. I do, however, disagree when it comes to America Chavez. She fits the now and is a character that many consider a hero to the LGBT community. Her being in the Young Avengers, the Ultimates, and A-Force for me qualifies. Maybe you can expand on your thoughts. Debbie in Des Moines, Iowa. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. Thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you for listening. Really appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate all you guys listening. And uh, But Debbie, I appreciate you writing me a letter. It's really sweet to be able to interact with you guys like this. And uh, and I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to, um, to talk about this and clarify uh, my position. Because I'm with you. I like America Chavez in a lot of regards. Uh, I, I've enjoyed some stories with her in it. I don't mind her as a character at all. However, there's a couple things going on with America Chavez and the problems that I have with her being introduced into the Marvel Cinematic Universe so early, for one, and where it is she's being introduced, okay? So if you're a big fan of the Marvel comic books, then you're a fan of the Young Avengers. Young Avengers were introduced by Alan Heinberg and Jim Chang relatively a little while ago, maybe two decades now. But... Their initial introduction, they are very similar looking to the Avengers. They're just sort of a young version of it. It's led by a masked uh, character named Patriot, who's a Captain America derivative. Asgardian, who is a Thor derivative. A character named Hulkling, who is, guess what, a Hulk derivative. And a character 
named Iron Lad, who is an Iron Man der derivative. And those four characters, the main four Avengers characters, they end up pulling in a couple other ancillary Avengers characters, which end up being Stature, who is Ant-Man's daughter. You see her in the films. Uh, and Hawkeye, uh, the, the young female Hawkeye. That's Hawkeye's partner. Um, and, um, and that is basically the initial team. Uh, eventually, Speed, who is one of the other Wanda and Vision children who has similar powers to Quicksilver, he gets added onto the team as well. But the initial team is this very similar to the Avengers team. And they were introduced as, as all a mystery. It's written by, um, uh, by Alan Heinberg, who wrote for the OC. Very, very modern sensibilities. Very funny. The way these characters interact with each other was clutch. As a fan of the comic books, I want to see the young Avengers brought to the big screen. I want to see it done as lovingly close to the comics that I've read. America Chavez does eventually show up in the comic books, but she doesn't show up until like a good decade after the Young Avengers are established. She's the most recent generation of comic characters that have been introduced in the comics. So by introducing her so fast, you're rushing her inclusion and then you end up having to shoehorn her, squeeze her into places that she's not supposed to be because, well, she's here now. So first sin of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness and introducing America Chavez is just that it's too soon. So timing. Timing is a big thing for this, okay? So that's the first thing. And, 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 it's, and again, it's not that I don't like America Chavez. It's that I don't like when she's been introduced, for one, and I don't like where she's been introduced. America Chavez is not known for having been introduced in the Doctor Strange comic book. It doesn't make any sense to introduce her in the Doctor Strange comic book. She has nothing to do with magic. She doesn't have like a goth vibe. Her artistic style and story style is not Doctor Strange. It doesn't fit within the confines of that story. When Doctor Strange puts together a team of characters, we're always looking for characters who have a noir, goth kind of vibe to them. Spider-Man is a cool vibe because he's a spider. Daredevil is a cool vibe. Punisher is a cool vibe. These fit the aesthetic of Doctor Strange. He lives in a dark world of magic and demons and great evil that he's keeping at bay. Meanwhile, you don't see as many team-ups with Doctor Strange and let's say Captain America or Iron Man because they don't always fill the same space the right way. You might see Doctor Strange come and guest star with the Avengers because Doctor Strange can be added to the Avengers and he adds a new flavor to the meal. But when Captain America or Iron Man go and appear in Doctor Strange's book, which is very dark and magic-y and goth, they don't fit the aesthetic the same way America Chavez doesn't fit the aesthetic. America Chavez is... um. A spunky teenager who, yeah, you know, she's 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 been with some teams and she's been kicking ass and whatnot, but she doesn't really fit the vibe for Doctor Strange, which is meant to be a little bit more dour. And we need people who are more his intellectual equal. Not to say his intellectual equal, because I'm not trying to say that like America Chavez isn't smart, but she's just she's younger, and by virtue of being younger, her perspective is a little bit uh, naive versus like a Doctor Strange who should be the opposite of naive, right? So we want to put characters that challenge the intellect of Doctor Strange alongside him. That's why America Chavez is not a good choice for the Doctor Strange film. There's literally one, no established moments in time where there's some classic America Chavez, Doctor Strange story. Nothing. So like this is the first big Doctor Strange, America Chavez story we've ever seen and it's being done in the movies. They didn't even test it out in the comics first. So this is weird. You're telling a story that's never been told before, and I can tell you, sight unseen, just looking at it, that it does not really work. The idioms of these two characters are too different, and they're going to fight each other. And that's what happens in the Doctor Strange movie. The tone of America Chavez fights with the tone of Doctor Strange, even though she's she's a perfectly acceptable fun character like, like I, have, I have nothing against her as a character her existence in any way shape or form i just want to see her introduced in a way that's really clever like like for me i would rather see uh her not be introduced and we get our young avengers movie and we get to see that story an adaptation of the first young avengers arc where the young avengers are established and then you do a follow-up 
movie that's all about America Chavez being introduced to the Marvel Cinematic Universe by virtue of that team, which she does eventually end up on that team, and she does have stories of being on that team. It's like, if you want to tell a story of the original five X-Men, and then let's just shoehorn Wolverine into it. Let's do a story of Cyclops, Jean Grey, Iceman, Beast, Angel, and Wolverine. You know, because of sales, and because people want to do, like, oh my God. When I start saying that, if you're an X-Men fan out in the audience, you're probably like, oh, sacrilege, don't do that. There are ways to do these things and do them right, and then there are ways to do it not so right. So, Debbie, I hope you understand the the place that I'm coming from now. Um, I, I really like nothing against America Chavez. I haven't been able to live with her long enough, so I can't say that she's like a favorite character of mine or anything, but she's never certainly never bothered me, and I think that she has the potential to be great. I think the way that they used her here really hamstrung her first appearance in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think it's been rushed and I hope that they don't try to shoo her in to the Young Avengers story which is wonderful and doesn't include her. So that's where I'm at. Thanks Debbie for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having a disagreement with me and uh, not just turning off the podcast. If you have any arguments that go against some of the things that I have here have said here today or have ever said, please write me an email. Don't hesitate. Jesse Blaze at jessesnyder.com. So thanks again to Debbie from Des Moines for writing and I look forward to getting more of your emails in the future. So let's bring this baby to a close. We are talking about Into the Spider-Verse 2. How's the movie, Jesse Blaze? Uh, it's good. It's good. It's not as good as the first one. So don't expect that. Right off the thing, it's not as good as the first movie. I'm just warning you. First movie is freaking brilliant. This one is not quite as brilliant. Is it as beautiful? Yeah, it's really beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever looked at. It's, it's gorgeous, and I look forward to kind of watching it more in the future because it's so pretty. It's the kind of thing where you don't even have to pay attention. It's super cool. What is the, pro- the main problem with it? There's basically two main problems that I see. One is the introduction with uh, Spider-Gwen. It is really long, and I, I want to say it was almost like a half an hour, or it felt that way. And basically, like a half an hour of Spider-Gwen backstory happens, and then all of a sudden, it cuts to the opening credits, and you're like, Whoa, (laughs) that was a lot. And as the movie goes on, you realize that you could have removed this first half an hour with Spider-Gwen and it wouldn't have changed anything. You would have been able to figure out everything that was going on and it might have even made a couple things more interesting and more mysterious and cool. So be prepared. The first like half an hour of it takes a little while to get going and, um, and you could get rid of that first half an hour and it would probably make the movie better. The second main problem with the movie is that it just ends. All right? I'm warning you ahead of time. Spoiler, it just ends. You think it's about to move on to the conclusion that the whole movie's been building up to, and right before it's about to happen, it just ends. And me and my girlfriend turned and looked at each other and went, What? Did did you know? Did did you know this movie was just going to end? Like, I had an idea that this was part one of another, but but I thought that this movie would have a satisfying ending, and then there would also be another movie, you know, and then it would say to be continued on some level. No, no, no. There is no ending here. Everything that is, like, beginning to work and percolate and whatnot in this movie, it just comes to an end at the end of the movie all of a sudden, and I really think that they should have warned the audience that that was going to happen. Um, But it does look good. You do care about the characters. You continue to care about Miles. You continue to care about Gwen. It's gorgeous. Lots of great Easter eggs in the the movie. But um, it's not as good as the first one. So lower your expectations and be prepared for a very unsatisfying conclusion. Well, that's the end of our show. Again, I'm Jesse Blaze Snyder, your best friend in geek culture, the coolest geek alive. I love you guys. I am so proud to be continuing this path of holding geek culture to a higher standard i'm so honored that you are with me on this path of change and i just hope that this leads somewhere good and that the fandom can take the power back and that we can demonstrate to the world how not racist we are and how not sexist we are and how if you just let these adaptations of these beautiful four color worlds happen the way they're supposed to The world will be a better place. Everybody will be happier. Everybody will make a lot of money. And 
the worlds will just keep growing and growing and growing and new and more diverse and interesting characters will be added all the time. Let's live in that world, that expansive world where these myths never die, where they never go away. That's the place where I want to live. Come live there with me and join me next time on another fabulous episode of The Coolest Geek Alive. Love you. Bye. You've been listening to Coolest Geek Alive with me, your host, Jesse Blaze Snyder. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe for more excellent geek culture content. Thanks for listening. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Coolest Alive. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Stay with your tribe. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Revenge of the Geeks. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Week after week. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Laughing with you. And cried sometimes through It's gonna be freaking awesome Spilling it out It's gonna be freaking awesome Making you shout Oh my genius I got lyrics coming out me bum For days Freaking awesome, talking some shit. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Living your shit. My it's gonna be freaking so awesome. Food in our mouth. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Get in our mouth. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Tell all your friends. It's gonna be freaking awesome. Draw right on text. It's, it's gonna, gonna be, be freaking awesome. Reason to buy. awesome freaking awesome it's going to be freaking awesome just wait you'll see you'll all see <laughs>